of you online, I just want to say good morning, and to the rest of you who are coming in, I want to give you a, a, a warm welcome, as I have been doing so uh, with everybody else. If, if you're online and you're you're tuning in, it's it's a cool place um, being here, and uh, it's just family, and, and we're glad that you would join us online, and some of our church family that is online that we haven't seen in a while. Thanks for being with us. Um, I once heard, I love this statement, I once heard that um, there is no place <clears throat> anywhere near this place like this place. This must be the place. Right? Um, <laughs> we've, we've gathered here as believers, um, and I just, I just, I say this, I've been saying this just about every week. I, I think it's worth always the repeat. Are you persuaded that he is able to keep that which you have committed against that day? Can I get an amen? Yeah. You know he's returning. He's going to come back and get his church. And when we stand before the great throne, our only plea is Jesus. In his saving work. Not because of the good we have done, not because of anything we've done. And I am convinced. Oh, I am persuaded. And that's what Paul said that he is able because it's all on him. Let's celebrate the King and the Lord and the Savior today, okay? Father, I just come to you this morning. I am grateful for every person that entered the doors of this building. They came because they wanted to. They weren't forced by gun to be here. They're, they're here because they want to come. And they want to express to you our gratitude for all that you've done for us. Um, that doesn't mean life has been easy. It just means that you've been with us. And we're grateful. We're a grateful people. And we're thankful. We call that worship, Lord, to put you front and center and make you the person of our worship. Please receive our, our attempts and our acts of worship from the depth and the core of who we are and from our hearts to you. And the people of God said, and amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord if you're able. All right. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing. I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a 
am a friend of God. He called me friend. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. God Almighty, Lord. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He called me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He called me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He called me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He called me friend. Hallelujah. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Amen. My strength is in your name, for you alone can say, you will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always my side. Nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. Nothing formed again. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Ever present. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from fear, leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend you are my desire one else will do cause nothing else could take you 
your place to feel the warmth of your embrace help me find the way bring me back to you been like. But what I do know, what I'm absolutely certain of, is that you didn't go through the week by yourself. Let's pray to him, okay? In the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, Oh, what a matchless name. In the name of God, the Holy Spirit, I seek your face this morning, Lord, and I've been given the honor and privilege of being the person to um, voice our, our appreciation and our thanks and our thanksgiving to you on behalf of all of these who tuned in with us online and who've gathered in this room. And so I just open up, Lord, and I just say to you, hear me when I say this because I don't say it of my own accord, but God, we just know that you are an awesome God. We are certain of your love for us. We are in awe of, of your friendship. Oh, that we could be a friend to God. We, um, Lord, we, we are just taken by your willingness to always be with us. You keep your promises always, and you, Lord Jesus, 
promised us that you'd be with us to the end of the ages. Until earth as we know it is no more. And then you'll still be with us. And you were the one who walked with us this week. You're the one who went there into the hospital rooms with Claire. And you're the one who's been the great physician with those in our congregation who's needed your touch physically. You're the one, Lord God, who when we, our spirits are low and our emotions are depressed and we find ourselves wondering if there's anybody that cares from time to time. We're like the prophet from time to time. We think we're the only one. When the truth is, is we're not. Because you're the one that has gone with us through this week. We have managed to eat our meals, pay our bills, most of us. Because you have met our needs. You will, you haven't failed us, you'll, you'll not start now. And we just, we worship you for who you are. I pray, Father, this morning then just ask that you would, that you would meet the needs of this congregation in the week to come. Should you tarry that long, Lord, just go with us wherever we go. I marvel and I'm in awe of the fact that we can approach you. We don't need a priest. We don't need a pastor. We, Lord, you, you rent the curtain to the, holy, to, to the approach of the holies of holies. That we can come before the throne of God any time, any place, any day. And have your attention. How can that be? Thank you. Father, as a church, we pray for, for your mission and your vision that is for each one of us personally in our lives. And when I say that, Lord, I'm thinking about our neighborhoods. You know, those people that live to the right of us and the left of us and the ones that live across from us and the ones that live behind us. And you've called us to be salt and light. And you've called us, Lord God, to be witnesses. And you called us, Lord, and employed us. You, you gave us heavenly work to do on earth. And not one person is beneath the privilege or too low in status. For you esteem us higher than the office of our national presidency and employ us. Use us to reach our neighbors. Use us to love our neighbors as ourselves. May your glory and your face just shine not only upon us, but through us. Jesus, we pray for our leaders. We pray for the ones that are our bosses. They're, they're leaders. And the ones that are um, in charge of our city and the various programs and agencies like police and fire. Emergencies, ambulances, electric companies. We pray for our state and the leadership that's represented there. We pray, Lord God, for our nation and the leadership that's represented there. And we, we, of course, Lord, pray for those in our world, those who would even be our enemies. Now, Lord, we wouldn't pretend to be so intelligent that we know what all of them stand in need of or what they need to be doing or what solutions are. But what we are depending on is your Holy Spirit would begin to teach all things and give wisdom to leadership. So that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
have to say to you, Jesus, thank you for the incarnation, for, for what we call Christmas, coming and, and walking amongst us for, for more than 30 years, and just being with us and rubbing elbows with us and getting dirty feet and sandals on dirty streets with us and eating with us, drinking with us. Thank you for the cross and your sacrifice that atones for our sins. Thank you for the empty tomb and the promise of eternity of heaven made possible, the resurrection, and you proved it. Thank you for the ascension and for becoming our great and high priest. Thank you for the promise that you'll come again. We may be where you are. None of us, Lord, in all honesty and transparency, look forward to death in the sense of the pains of death. But we are excited about the possibilities that are being put into place for us. Oh, to think of a place where there's no tears and there's no hunger there's no disease, there's no death. That's exciting. I say to you, Lord, we love you with our being. And the people of God said, amen. This is a new song, and um, you're, as soon as it starts, you'll know why I love it. It's Celtic, and I am very fond of the Celtic songs, but it's also what they call a modern day hymn. And our iSing app doesn't have a lot of hymns. So I jumped on this one and it's just got the most wonderful words. So join in as you learn. Love could remember no wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more Praise the Lord, his mercy is more His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cause. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. 
His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Um, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is, yeah. I, um, I'm, I think today, I'm going, I think, wrap up today. And I know I say this every Sunday, and I never am brief, okay? So I don't know today if I'll be brief. I, I hope to be brief. Because today, I want to also, um, because I didn't want to come here this morning and not exalt our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of coming here. It is for us to get together and worship the Lord together. God is worthy of our praise. In fact, Scripture teaches us that God inhabits the praise of his people. The psalmist wrote that. I'm just, I'm just you know, that's where God is. Um, he said where two or more would gather together. I, I'm going to be in that mix in a special way. And so this is what this is really all about. So let's exalt the Lord and Savior. We are on a, um, uh, this is part three, because officially it became a series um, in the third sermon, which was the introduction, um, but really this started five weeks ago when I was in the book of Revelations, the 17th chapter, talking about um, reaching um, the lost back then, and then the next week, if you remember, um, I dealt with <clears throat> I dealt with um, being indwelt with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is very much a part of the mission, and uh, and so this this series is on re- rediscovering our mission. This is what I'm calling part three. It's really part five, I guess, if you go all the way back. Um, <clears throat> it's not a lot of verses. Um, Miss Debbie, good to see you back there. Would you mind pressing the buttons on the PowerPoint for me? The title of this is is the joy of our mission. Okay, and uh, I just I just want to talk for a few moments about about what a joy it is to be in service of the King, to be commissioned, to be partnership. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is. It's where, where, where you put two heads, okay, into this apparatus called a yoke so that you might work in tandem. Pretty cool thought, isn't it? Take my yoke upon you. For it's easy and light, Jesus said, and the mission is, is a part of that. Let me um, in, in this series, I've, I've just I've been taken, and I said this I said this uh, I think last week, how almost like driving down the ro- the highway and you look at those little white dashes or double yellow lines, you know, and they zip by so fast at seventy miles an hour, you know, I I, I feel like. Scriptures are just zipping by me that talk so much about how Jesus Christ from the front end shared with us his intention for us to take on his mission. And he did it in all kinds of parables, and I had mentioned some. Um, if you had tuned in last week, uh, Tim thought that maybe I should preach on uh, the Good Samaritan. He said that, that lends itself to how you do the Great Commission and love. And remember last week we were talking about seeds and sowing, and, and we talked about what if you fertilize, what would be the fertilizer for, for uh, Jesus Christ's mission? It would be love. Okay, remember, we, we, we just ring some bells. We've been talking about mission and doing the, the mission of Jesus Christ. So let me jump into another uh, parable that Jesus gives that just kind of takes it and looks at this whole thing from another perspective. And uh, we'll share a few things, and then uh, we'll, we'll call it the word of the Lord, all right? It's found in Matthew, the 18th chapter. It's a familiar text. Many of us have heard it. Um, I think it's Mark also makes mention of um, the parable of the 90 and 9, okay? And uh, I'm going to be in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Uh, I like it because it's it's just four verses. 
And boy, you would think four verses would be like a three-minute sermon, right? Right? If my wife was preaching it, of course, she does Reader's Digest condensed versions all the time. Let's read it together. Um, and it's up, up for you to, to read along with me. Here's uh, the words of Jesus. This is what Jesus said. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, giving us his mission, right, right, right up front. There it is. There's his mission. This is what Jesus came to do, is to save that which was lost. What do you think, he says? Uh, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them strays, does he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek the straying one? And if it happens that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices more over it than over the ninety and nine which did not stray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that any, any of these little ones should perish. Father, I've just read your word. It, it's... <laughs> It's brief. Jesus, you, you just had a way of saying things that just make the point. And so, Holy Spirit, help me not to mess it up. And I, and I pray, Lord, that you would help me, because I can't do this by myself, help me to help us, Lord, to just take away from this a great joy in the task that you've called us to. Be honored, be glorified, be magnified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. When I started this series, I, I, I got to tell you, I've recognized, I relate to the angst that comes with talking about the mission. It's like, here we go again. You know, I got to go knock on doors. I got to go learn the four spiritual laws. I need to learn the Romans road. And there's a host of, of pamphlets and booklets that um, when I came into Christianity, it was in this, it, um, um, it was in the late. 70s, early 80s, when I became a Christian, wasn't always a Christian, uh, when I came to Christ, and I've seen, you know, uh, the Billy Graham evangelistic thrusts, and I've just, you know, I've had pastors take me through, and, and every time pastors get up to preach, I, I remember the sense and the angst of, oh, and I got to be honest with you, there is nothing joyous about it. And I think that's where a lot of the church, you know, we just get an angst. And I said something last week that I hope you picked up on, and that is, is that not all of us are, are called to be evangelists, but all of us are called to be witnesses. And there's huge difference. Okay? And witnessing is, is about the relationship that we have with Jesus and that he has with us, and it's about us sharing good news with other people. Here is a story of, of, a, of a man who, um, who, who had a hundred sheep, okay? And Jesus, before he gets to it, he, he, he reminds on the front end. I love this about Jesus. On the front end, this is, this is what I need from my followers. This is, this is what my followers will be about doing because it's about what he came to do. He said, the son of man, referring to himself, was his favorite term for himself, has come to save that which is lost. And then he asks the question, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and want to go to the mountains and seek the straying one. Now, well, the first thing come to my mind when I was reading that this morning, it's not, it's not, it didn't hit me when I'm preparing for this, but, but this morning as I'm reading it to you, is like, yeah, but wouldn't it be better and worth more if they were cattle instead of sheep? Okay? But I love it that it's sheep then, even if you use that analogy, because Jesus, before he said what his mission was in the verse before, and he follows it up at the close of this section, he calls his sheep the little ones. Those are terms of endearment. Now, some people think he's just talking about children. He's not talking just about children. He's talking about his children. That's you and me. 
it was a term, it was very much a term to, to, to express his affection about how he feels about his greatest creation. That's people. And he's, if you, if you read in front and back of, if you got in and, and, and in its context and read the other parables all surrounding it, you would understand that he would continue to talk about reaching the lost and, and, and that which caused, caused them to sin. But, but here he's talking about if there, a man has a hundred sheep and just one of them strays. You've listened to me before and you've heard me say that, that Jesus Christ would have gone to the cross if it meant only rescuing one person in all of, of humanity's history. He would have. And how do I know that to be true? Because I'm reading what he says here. And what, does that, what does that translate out to for you and me? That means that he loves you. That means, guys, that, that you're, you're God's son and and. And God is like going, that's my boy. That means, ladies, that, that you are God's daughter, and he's going, he's going, look, that's my girl. And they are all that to me and so much more. Well, what do I... Um, what I want to share with you is basically three things, and they're really questions um, that I want to share uh, about, about the mission. And one is, is I, I want to ask you this question. Do we, share, do we share our master's mission? I mean, are you, are you, do, you, do you think about it? When you get up in the morning and you go to work, do you, do you stop or, or you get up in the morning and you have, you have to go down to the supermarket, and you know that you need milk and bread. If you if you got children at home, you you don't go out and get in the car without stopping for milk and bread. That's just a given. Um, you need to always have cash in your pocket because you're going to stop for milk and bread because you know, you're always out when you have children. David, that's a that's a time for an amen. Okay, all right. Um, that is just how it is. And so, what the real question is is that when when we read in Matthew, when he, Jesus gives us the Great Commission, as you are going, make disciples, be a part of the mission, do you, do you, as you are going through this journey of life with Jesus, you in the yoke with him, in tandem work with him, as you are going, Jesus doesn't expect you to get an, uh, th this mission, he doesn't expect you to get a new job as a pastor somewhere to share him with others. What he really expects is for you and he to go together down to the supermarket because he knows and you know that you don't get in the car without stopping for milk and bread. And there's somebody there who's selling milk and bread who may or may not know the glorious, wonderful relationship and should the Holy Spirit in that stop at Quick Trip, that's a good place to go, David, at Quick Trip, because the prices are good, it's a good place to stop, that if Jesus opens the window and the conversation opens up, you will be happy to step into that conversation. If this conversation doesn't open up, you look at Jesus and you say, well, obviously this is not, and you say to the Holy Spirit, this is not where we're going. But my question is to you is, do you and I share our master's mission? He gave it to us, for the Son of Man has come to save and seek that which was lost. His whole purpose for the in, of the incarnation was to come and save the lost. If we know the heart of Christ is to save the lost, do, uh, does it stir us to the core of our being to help others to know the joy of, of our salvation, of the Lord's salvation, of what we have with Jesus? We live in a nation right now who is probably devoid of hope. You and I live in a time in the church when we have what they're looking for.
Now there's a mission. What people need to hear more than anything else is that there is hope. There is hope. There's hope for our nation. There's hope for our communities. There's hope for our lives. And you and I, as we walk with Christ, walk in this glorious hope, and it's part of his mission that others would know the hope that is in Jesus Christ. When I lay on, I was thinking about Clara a lot, Clara having surgery. Now, what you don't know probably is, is that it was in the email that he had a twisted bowel. That's a serious surgery. I got word from, um, from Miss Debbie that um, she got um, that his surgery, he was go- at 1 o'clock. They were expecting to hear something. When I got word, it was after 7 o'clock, and I still hadn't heard a thing that day. And by the way, the... Um, I told you, Pastor Judy, when you started it, that I think that was on Wednesday. He actually didn't have surgery. They put it off till Thursday. And I keep, I keep thinking about how when I had my surgery last, last summer, when I'm laying there on, on a table and I'm, I'm wanting desperately to pray for the doctors, not because I'm afraid of dying, And I thought, you know what, Lord, this is probably the greatest scenario ever because you know I'm a big baby when it comes to pain. But they got me, they got me hopped up on drugs now. They're gonna put me to sleep here in a second. And I won't feel a thing if I'm coming to meet you today. I love it. What was that? That was a sure hope. In Jesus Christ, I have something that everybody else is looking for. You have something that others are looking for. But it is the Lord's mission. The Son came to seek and to save that which is lost. Peter wrote to the church. He had two letters he wrote to the church. Peter, I like Peter because he's short, sweet, and to the point, unlike me. I'm a little more like Apostle Paul. I got a lot of words to say the same thing. Peter said in his letter, in his second letter to the church, um, I was actually asked where I thought about it, preaching from. And he said this. He said, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. Now, he's in context, this is about the Lord's coming again to get his church and pronounce judgment and He said, the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Peter got it. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You know, repentance is is a turnaround, change life, a new life, actually. Peter got it. It was the mission of the church. It was Christ's mission. And what Peter was saying to the church is, he says, look, I just want to remind you what the prophet said. Jesus is coming. He will come. And there'll be scoffers who, in in his letter, he said, there'll be scoffers. And they'll scoff and say, oh, yeah, you guys, you Christians have been saying this forever. I mean, the, the Jews said it. Now you Christians are saying it. Jesus is coming back. It's been thousands of years, right? Uh huh. Whatever. And, and, G, and Peter said, I, I just want to remind you that the reason God is tarrying so long, taking so long, is first that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. He, he exists outside of time. You and I exist inside of time, but not God. And he said, and a day is like a thousand years. You, you know, I, I, I can't wrap my head around this, but it's, it's, it's a reality um, that one, one day we'll enter into eternity where there would be no real passage of time because time is just the marking of, of what we call the sunrise, the revolution of the earth around the sun. And we mark that, and we have mornings and nights, and God created it. And at one point, God steps into history in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's writing here, and he says, I, you know, don't get all sure. He was telling the church, don't get all worked up, you know, because they say that, and they scoff, and they laugh at you. He said, um, I just, I need to remind you, you know, that a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years for the Lord. Um, but God is coming, and he will bring judgment. 
And that day will be hastened, but he said, God is patient, and God is long-suffering, and God has put this off a long time because there's a lot of people who need the Lord. And the whole reason that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, was to seek and save the lost. That's the mission. Second question that I have for you, not only do, do you share the master's mission, but do we share the master's burden? I, 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 it's fascinating to me when I study about shepherds in the day of Jesus' day and then King David's day, when you go back a few more, a uh, couple more thousand years, you go back and you, when King David was a shepherd boy and uh, um, it was a shepherd. And Jesus, Jesus liked this, this, this whole concept of being the great shepherd, the good shepherd, and calling us his little ones. You know, I mean, who doesn't think of lambs in a fond way? That he would leave, because that's how it worked in those days. They didn't have electric fences to keep the critters, the dangerous critters, the wolves and such out. He would leave the 90 and I and go and seek the lost. Um, he was... He was so burdened that he would leave the 99 and went on after the lost sheep. If he was willing to leave, get this, think about this for a moment. If he was willing to leave, see, Jesus was in on creation, so he was at the Father's right hand. And what we celebrate as Christmas is his first coming, is that he left heaven and took on the form, stepped into history. If he was willing to leave the glorious station so that he might win us, he, he and the Father and the Holy Spirit were burdened for our plight and where we stood with God that we needed to be rescued. And so I say to the church, do we share our master's burden? He was willing to leave the glory and come to earth and save in order to save us, surely he will be burdened about one lost sheep. And I don't know about you, but it struck me. I've read this a lot of times, but every time I read it, something different strikes me. But what really, really struck me takes me to my last point. I can't really be that I'm going to be this quick, right? Do we share our master's joy? Did, did, you, did you happen to catch it when I read it to you that he had more joy over the one found saved sheep than for the 99 who didn't need saved? Did, did, you, did you pick up on that? He, he didn't say as much joy in comparison. He said, more joy. I don't know about you, but when I read it, I got this vision of Jesus with this lamb over his shoulders, and he's doing the dance, a happy dance. I found him. I found him. And when he looks at the other 99, it's good to have you, but he's not dancing about them. He's dancing about the one. And when we look at it in our humanity, we, we think of it, it just, just pretended that, it, you know, he's daddy. He's certainly big brother. And, and it's like, well, I don't know about you, but it makes me say, well, that's not fair. Don't I matter? But then I think when we get real honest about things, and we really get a compassion and a burden and a love that God has. Things change in us. And instead of us saying when we, when we are we're and we are burdened and we take on, you know, the mission of the master and the burden of the master, we will 
also take on the joy of the master. And instead of us saying, that's not fair, you and I, when we see the master dancing, we grab our partner, I'll grab you, David, and we'll lock arms like in a hee-haw, and we'll be doing a hee-haw. Look at the master, he's so excited. Can I get an amen? The question is, do we share our master's joy. There is an excitement. I don't, in my life and in my ministry, I wish I could say I have led hundreds to the Lord. I, I think I have, like I was preaching last week, I think I have scattered seeds and been a part of the process of hundreds to the Lord. But my personal ministry, I've led a few to the Lord. Probably could count on two hands that I have personally, not everybody gets to harvest, you know, gets to pick the fruit. That's God's job anyhow, right? But all of us get to be a part of that. And when we see it taking place, it just becomes so natural part of us when we share the master's joy and in, in that he's so excited. And, and, and when we read other parables, it says that all the angels are having a party in heaven over the prodigal son. We get, we get pretty worked up and excited ourselves. I, um, in, in the school system where I, where I work, I often days will ask a certain different teachers at different times, well, was it a productive day? Did you change the world by changing a mind today? This past Friday, I stepped into a room and I asked a teacher, I asked a teacher, I said, um, well, was it a productive day? Did, did you connect any, did any dots connect for some students? You know, and for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm a custodian in, in, a, in a, a junior high school. So, you know, there's sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And they're probably the hardest group to make the dots connect. Okay, they're the most challenging. You're a teacher. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it's the toughest group. Um, in, in different kinds of ways. And I had a teacher say to me, um, she teaches coding and just kind of a, a hands-on science. And, you know, and, and um, I talked to her a little bit about coding for uh, Adreno boards and that kind of thing that I, some stuff I've done here in the church. She goes, man, you amaze me. And um, so I said to her Friday, I said, you know, um, well, how was your day? And she said, well, it was a good day. And I said, um, I said to her, um, did did you, you connect any dots for the students? Did you change the world today by changing mind and teaching a mind? And she began to tell me. This big smile got on her face. She says, you know what? I actually did. Said, since I started, since school started, she said, I had a young man who, um, you know, he just, she said, I don't, want say, I don't want to say he's a troublemaker, but, but he would just, you know, and so I, I kind of filled in the, the vernacular for her and said, well, he just was disruptive. She goes, yeah, he was disruptive, because she didn't want to say anything negative about him, and she wanted to be positive, <laughs> and she said, and um, she said, I sat down with him and, and started explaining, and he started writing code, you know, um, David, you know what code is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this computer language that makes things work. And he loved it. And she said, he has been like on the edge of his seat. She said, he asked me, she said, do they, do they pay people a living to do this? And she said, yeah. She said, he's like become my star student. I got to tell you something. She was happy. But I was happy. I mean, it, 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 I don't know about you, doesn't that just do something for you? To hear about a life that we know has been transformed and changed, not, not in spiritual ways, mind you, but, but, but in citizenship for sure. And I was like pumped. I said, that is so awesome. 
I, I mean, I was, I didn't dance with her, but I was like ready to do the hee-haw. You know, skip a do, David. I was ready to do that with her because inside was this joy. Church, there's no greater joy than the master's joy when a life is made new. When somebody finally realizes and, and knows what it means to be forgiven, it's exciting. And it's a joyous occasion. And it's tears of joy on the master's cheeks, and it's a dancing occasion, and he makes a party out of it every time in heaven. He gets his throngs of angels, and I can't imagine the song. Oh, do we share our master's joy. Debbie, there's a last, there's a last frame. Let me make that it. Let's be done. Um, isn't there? No, there isn't. I, I, I deleted it. Never mind. Yeah, I did. I deleted it. There's nothing more exciting than seeing a life totally redeemed. I would suggest that if you want to know and share in the, the master's joy, be a witness. Join the master's mission. Be intentional. For it brings our master great joy. For those of you who are online who might be listening in who have never um, who have never received Christ as your Savior, I want to pray a prayer. I want to pray a prayer for the church, and I want to pray a prayer for those of you who might want to know a life of redemption. First for the church. Father, it is exciting in the educational realms, in, in the spiritual realms, more exciting to see lives turned around. I spoke to my 17-year-old granddaughter who's on a nine-month mission trip, and just to hear her excitement about being with other believers of different denominations and just working as a team, It, it made me just want to join her. I don't know how, Lord, in fact, I, I'm sure I cannot do this, only you can, to convey and communicate to the church that it has never been your plan for there to be an angst when it comes to sharing you and your love and the good news to be a witness to be sensitive to you and Holy Spirit to not be and, and I think because our reaction to individuals in the church who have been actually in, in your face and annoyance but when we're led by you Holy Spirit, it is always the perfect time. And you won't ask us to do anything before time. But I'm praying that there will be some conversations that happen even this week. That causes us to remember the great joy of helping other people hear the great news. Lord, for those who may not be in the church and are tuning in online, I, I would just, I, I want to lead them through this prayer because I find it amazing how simplistic it is to have our sins forgiven. Simply by coming to you, Lord Jesus, and confessing to you, saying, you know, I know I'm broken. I know that I stand in opposition to God, that I have the sin in my life. That doesn't make me different than any other person ever born into humanity for all of sin. But I want to be different. 
And I am told, Lord, that if I ask you for forgiveness, you will come into my being. You will transform me. You will make me new. I'll still be who I am, but I'll be different. You will begin a journey with me. You will forgive my sins and throw them into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. Something even I cannot do, you can. And I want it. So I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Master. I confess you as Savior. Save me, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Your presence. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arm